Mm-hmm. All right. Looks like we're on. Are we on? I think we're on. Hey, everybody. My name's Jonathan Sexton. I'm a senior partner at the Bold Square Group, the MC for today for 3686 now. Um, and I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of Launch Tennessee to this really exciting event. Uh, it's the first of a new monthly series, so I guess you can expect to be seeing more 3686 and nows as, as they roll out. Um, and they're really focused on curating high-level conversations around tech investment and connecting people with Tennessee to some of the uh, biggest and greatest entrepreneurial ecosystems uh, in the country and around the globe. So today's installment is about deep roots. That's the first installment. Um, and there's really two things I think that we really hope that everyone takes from today. One is, is really Tennessee's deep capacity for innovation uh, in technology and how that's anchored by these uh, critical institutions like Oak Ridge National Lab, Tennessee Valley Authority, and uh, the University of Tennessee. Those anchors um, really serve to connect this com these communities across the state to um, each other. And how do we build a statewide ecosystem and take advantage of these huge uh, opportunities we have to have these institutions in, in our region? Um, additionally, later on in the day, uh, we are going to be diving into some best practices and lessons learned from entrepreneurs and investors from the front lines of Silicon Valley, which is super exciting. We're really pumped to have this uh, coastal collaboration going on today. Um, and we hope that uh, you're here today to see that entrepreneurial ecosystems can be built anywhere, uh, but that Tennessee is especially a place where, uh, especially ripe for continued innovation uh, and to stay established as really, a, a, I was going to say a city on the rise, but a, a state uh, ecosystem on the rise. And, and people really want to keep a lookout for what's happening in Tennessee. Uh, like I said, today's event is brought to you by Launch Tennessee. Uh, which empowers Tennessee's entrepreneurial ecosystem by facilitating capital formation, market building, and resource connection. A uh, few housekeeping items. If obviously by now you figured out we are using Lunch Pool um, to really get the most. And by the way, Lunch Pool is a Tennessee based, uh, Knoxville based startup company that is doing really big things. So we want to give a huge shout out uh, for uh, pulling all this together. Pool, a couple of things. Number one, in the top right corner of your screen, I wish I had a point there. Uh, there is an icon probably with the first letter of your name. Um, if you click that, you can fill out your profile. If you fill out your profile when you're in that cool um, area, people can see your face there. So you can also, it's like your digital business card, uh, is what Mary at Lunchpool told me to say. And, and I think it's dead on. Second is feel free to, when the speakers aren't on, you feel free to move about the cabin. If you want to network, you can go to these different tables that you see on the screen uh, and double click a seat and that's how you move to that table and you can have a conversation with the people you see there. Um, number three is feel free to use the on the side of the screen, I think this side, hopefully I'm pointing this side. Is that how's it in my backwards? Okay, uh, cool, sorry. Um, I swear I know left from right most of the time. Uh, this way, the chat, so you can communicate with each other, but also you can, there's Q&A sections, so through the series of interviews today, you can upvote different questions that you might have or someone else has, and hopefully get them answered by the speakers. Um, so that is the housekeeping I have around lunch pool. So sit back, relax, network, be excited about today's great event. Uh, we've got a ton of great speakers today. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Um, and with three of East Tennessee's, uh, three of Tennessee's, biggest leaders uh, across the state when it comes to technology, innovation, and really anything else you can think of, and three of Silicon Valley's finest. So, very excited to have you here today. And we should be getting started here just uh, in a few minutes. Ah. 
There hey. he is. How are you? It's good to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? I'm doing good. Long time to see. It has been. Yeah, I was excited to hear that you were going to be, I don't know if you're my host or interrogator or what your particular role is, but either way, I'm, I'm ready for it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm both. I tried to come up with the hardest questions for you uh, that okay. I possibly could. And I tried to come up with a, an introduction for you that, uh, that, you know, no one else would say. Uh, most people would probably say that you are Randy Boyd, the president of the University of Tennessee System or the founder of uh, Radio Systems. Um, and uh, or drive to 55 or so many of these big things. But my favorite Randy Boyd accolade is that you are a first gen college graduate from South Knoxville, um, which is something you and I have always shared in common. Well, thank you. Um, and, and so thanks for joining us today. Uh, we've only got a few minutes. And so uh, I'm going to try and get through five questions in our 15 okay. minutes that together. Um, so one question when you moved from the private sector to ecd i heard you be asked all the time was you know how do you transition mentally from kind of being a running an entrepreneur to you know, being in this bureaucratic system um and i wonder if now this kind of ties back to that uh, first gen college student has you've got this uh, hustle about you that a lot of people don't have how do you bring that hustle and grit to the university system now, and is that different than than how it was even at ECD, um, let alone radio systems? And how do you move this, bring this fast moving mentality, and make it live inside of a big university? Well, well, thank you, Jonathan. I haven't actually ever been asked the question about having hustle and grit, but I think it's almost uh, uh, a prerequisite if you're going to be an entrepreneur. I've never met an entrepreneur that didn't have hustle and grit. Somebody who just kind of lay back and good things just happen to them. I've never heard that story or met that person. So. I think that's going to be true no matter uh, for all of our entrepreneurs on this on this call. Um, mm -hmm. Things that are the same, and it's something that's you know it's been really interesting going from the private sector for 30 years running my own business to going into the public sector. And you know, like maybe a lot of people, I knew I was good at selling dog fences and building this corporate uh, corporation, um, but could I do anything else? And do the things that you learn in business translate to uh, the public sector? Here's things. Here's uh, four things that I found that you need to be successful, whether it's a private business or a public business or higher education. Uh, and I'll do it quickly because we've got five questions and, and we've got just a few minutes. Uh, one, have a mission that's aspiring and inspiring. A great mission lives between the probable and, po and the impossible. Have something that people can get excited about. You don't know where you're going, nobody's gonna go with you. So mm -hmm. make sure you have that. Second, have a strategy. It doesn't need to be complicated. Just something simple and executable. Third, surround yourself with great people. It doesn't matter what kind of mission or what kind of strategy you have. If you don't have great people, you're not going to get there. And then fourth, have a set of values that keeps it all in, in line. Those principles have worked in every type of organization, higher education, um, mm -hmm. service and government, or nonprofits, or in business. Here's the thing that's different. The level of persuasion in each of those different organizations grows in order of magnitude. In a business, mm -hmm. you, you have to have everybody on board. they got to buy into your mission. Otherwise, they're passive aggressive. and You're not going to get things done. But at the end of the day, if somebody doesn't fit, you can just let them go. Uh, in, 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 in public service and government, uh, you need 51% of the votes. As so you can get 51%, you can get it done. But you don't have the ability to, uh, uh, if you set a mission for your state, like the drive to 55, you don't mm -hmm. have the ability if somebody comes up to you and says, you know, I don't really believe in that. You know, in business, you can say, well, you're probably not a good fit. But in, 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 in the state, you can't really say, you know, Tennessee's probably not a good place for you. You should probably try Kentucky. We're kind of stuck with each other. <laughs> in higher education, you've got so many independent actors with different um, goals and aspirations and agendas from uh, the faculty to the alumni to the legislature to the people of the Tennessee to your staff uh, to the students to their parents. All need to be supported and recognized and all have a different uh, perspectives. And so in higher education, it takes an e even higher level of persuasion to get it something done. That's a quick summary of the differences and the, and the commonalities. Uh, that's, that's, that's great. And I think that culture and team building you're almost forced to do, although it probably slows things down along the way, does maybe uh, lead to a solution that works for everybody um, or hopefully that's the ideal, right? Or works for the most people. Can, can I, can um, I on that, Jonathan? I'm, I'm messing up the number of questions, but I would say- You're good, you're good. 
in, in any organization, and that's a really good observation of yours, building a team does slow things down at the start, but it's at your own um, demise later on. Uh, you try to do something really fast. You already know the answer, but just go forward. Uh, if you don't take the time to build the, uh, uh, the team and get everybody's support and buy-in, in the end, you're not going to be successful. Take more time in the start to build that support and buy-in before you rush off. I think the uh, going to college in general uh, is is a testament to that exact statement, right? Take the time to do the things right, and so it will propel you further in the future. Um, and it's really hard to talk about um, the entrepreneurial ecosystem without talking about talent. And the University of Tennessee is uh, so obviously one of the biggest drivers of talent in our region, if not the biggest. And the university has done a lot of cool things over the years, Boyd Venture Challenge, contests, uh, lots of things to help entrepreneurship. Kids in the business school, a lot of times, be entrepreneurs. But one thing that's been really interesting to me was the entrepreneurship minor that was introduced a few years ago. And I was curious what's your perception of how that's performed? Are you seeing the results you want uh, from the entrepreneurship minor and, and kind of what's next for that? No, I, I, so um, I think it's new. So I, it's really a little early to talk about all the great entrepreneurs or business leaders that we've generated as a result of it. But I think it's an important component of the overall ecosystem that we're trying to create. You mentioned the Boyd Venture Fund, where we give grants to people that are students that want to start their own businesses. And then we also have uh, now uh, uh, trying to build a, a, a continuing pipeline for them to continue to succeed. We just launched uh, about two months ago now something called mm -hmm. Park, a new innovation center at Cherokee Farms where uh, businesses that are um, raising Series A, uh, they, they've got, they're beyond concept, they've got an ongoing business, but they need a place to incubate. We've got a place for them mm -hmm. as well. We've got the Anderson Center. We've got a lot of different resources that they can put together to find the right path for them. But the entrepreneurship uh, minor is a key part of it. I love the idea of the entrepreneurship minor because a lot of people in a lot of fields don't consider themselves entrepreneurs, but really, if whether you're a musician or a graphic designer or, or a software engineer, you you have the capacity to be an entrepreneur, and that just might not be what you call yourself. Um, yeah. And the university is enabling that. You know, Jonathan's a musician. I know from, from I mean, he knows my son or what. I guess I don't know if you consider yourself a musician still. He doesn't usually use that moniker anymore, but he was. I remember. Um, when he was start running, starting his band and for the first eight years, he was uh, every bit the entrepreneur. What you have to do to be successful in a band, the sacrifices, the risks that you take, the hard work. Um, so a lot of people are more entrepreneurial or entrepreneurs that may not refer to themselves as entrepreneurs. You can be an entrepreneur in, in the social space, working in nonprofits, you know, creating a new nonprofit to, like Tennessee Achieves to send more kids to college. That's an entrepreneurial uh, initiative as well. That's right. It's, it's more of a mindset. Uh, it's it's just, just as much a verb as it is a noun. Um, uh, I know we're getting slim on time, I believe, but I do have one more question. If I can only get to three, I do have one more. And that is, from what I've seen in my corporate consulting work now is that uh, big companies have a hard time sometimes keeping up with the talent that is needed to evolve like the digital economy. So there's there's there are industries that exist now that didn't exist 10 years ago, right? So there's there's jobs in the market that are new and didn't exist a long time ago. How does the university approach or what's your view towards adjusting the talent gaps, you know, and, and making sure to the best you can that a big organization like the University of Tennessee is kind of keeping up with the trends um, in employment trends, basically, and job trends in the market? Well, there's two answers. One, we have advisory boards for each of our colleges that are usually consisting of People like in the business college, the people like myself, I used to be there on their advisory board, they give you input on what the workforce demands are. So you got that immediate real time uh, feedback. But the problem with that is that by the time the student graduates, you know, two, three, four, six years in the future, all that's changed again. So what you right. really need to do is uh, train uh, critical thinkers, people that are innovative and adaptive. And the most important thing that they learn in college is the ability to learn. Uh, and so if they can learn the skills that they need to continue to absorb uh, new information and adapt, that's the most important thing we can teach them. Yeah, 
I, again, I think the entrepreneurship minor is a great example of, of inserting that kind of critical thinking across um, across all sectors, all fields, no matter kind of what you're what you're studying. So, uh, last closing question: What are you most excited about in the in the next twelve months? Oh, I'm excited about a lot. I guess I'm excited about watching my new granddaughter uh, grow up that was born two and a half weeks ago. So that would probably be going away the, the most important. Uh, I thought that might be what you yeah. would say. From the University of Tennessee perspective, we have a uh, new campus in Southern Middle Tennessee that's going to be joining our system. It gives us the opportunity to provide a better education at a more affordable price to a whole uh, a region of our state that's been underserved for decades. And so that's a that's a big deal. Then personally, uh, one thing we I still have a little entrepreneurial uh, business on the side, which is Boyd Sports, and we're working hard to try to move the Tennessee Smokies to downtown Knoxville, and that's a big opportunity. Uh, and a complicated uh, challenge as well, but uh, if we can get all those things done. It'll be a great year. Yeah, that that's uh, more than a lot of people accomplish in a lifetime, Randy. So uh, best of luck. Uh, let us know how we can help, and um, I hope you have a great afternoon. It's good to catch okay. up with you. Yeah, great, great to see you, Jonathan. Bye now. Take care. All right, uh, do hand emojis, clap emojis. We don't have a stage, so I can't say uh, everyone give Randy Boyd a, a round of applause, but I think that you can put that in the chat. So uh, use your emojis. I'm sure uh, you would are super excited about that conversation and excited to keep it going. Um, and so now we're going to move to our next guest immediately, uh, Mr. Jeff Wyash. Jeff, how are you? Jonathan Sexton, it's very nice to meet you. Doing really well, Jonathan. Glad to be here. So, um, Jeff, we, we've been talking today about building entrepreneurial ecosystems, particularly in Tennessee, and, and the role that organizations and institutions like the university, like TVA, like OR, and L play in anchoring that innovation uh, and building that innovation economy. Um, I've heard it said that as, as you've been at TVA now since February 2019, um, and you're new to the area, I believe, uh, coming into TVA. That's right. So what's your perception so far of, of East Tennessee specifically? I'm curious about it. I know our audience is across the state today, but uh, um, what's your perception so far of the innovation economy um, and where we go from here? What's your, what's your take? Yeah, well, so, sort of in a, in a quick sentence, it's great potential. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm relatively new to TBA and to Eastern Tennessee, as you pointed out, been here less than two years, but uh, I've been involved in economic development uh, and, and a big part of economic development is igniting innovation and creating an innovation economy uh, in, in a whole bunch of other jurisdictions. So I was engaged with Development Research Triangle Park over in the Carolinas, mm -hmm. uh, the Tampa Bay region, Toronto. And one of the things I, that strikes me about Knoxville in Eastern Tennessee here is just great potential, great natural resources, mm -hmm. great institutions like University of Tennessee, Oak Ridge, EPRI, TVA, uh, great, um, great tradition of entrepreneurship here. Whether you think about Randy Boyd's companies or, or any one of a number of other companies headquartered here, uh, wonderful place to live. And so, uh, you know, the way I see it, it's great potential. If, if we can align around these things, get people excited, uh, support them with capital, lots of progress to be made here. Um, well, beyond, you just mentioned a few things, alignment, uh, excitement, kind of community buy-in, and of course, capital is kind of always an issue. But uh, is there anything else that you see that stands, like what's the gap between, in your mind, the potential we have, uh, and and what it could be. What are what are what's what, what happens in between there? Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think getting the institutions aligned around helping to support uh, an innovation and entrepreneurial economy here uh, is important. And Randy Boyd, Thomas Zachariah, who I know you're going to talk to here from Oak Ridge, and I are particularly interested in that. How do we line up our companies uh, to support this overall? I think that alignment has to extend, though, uh, to other economic development and entrepreneurial organizations here so that in greater Knoxville, uh, and I mean Knox County, Blunt County, Anderson mm -hmm. County, people aren't pulling against each other, but we're pulling together in the same direction. 
I think is really important. Um, I think we have to find ways to jumpstart this and demonstrate some successes. Mm -hmm. And then, Jonathan, the last thing I'd say is that the amount of entrepreneurship and innovation we have going on here right now is tremendous. But it may be the best kept secret uh, in the United States. So pe people from outside this area don't realize what a great environment this is and how many successes we're already producing. Mm -hmm. So we got to tell our story better. Right. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. And I appreciate that insight. And one, one thing that's interesting about expanding beyond the kind of the walls of TVA is I've read that you um, said that, you know, the future of energy and particularly T TVA is for you guys to be more innovative, more agile um, mm -hmm. and, and flexible. And in your partnerships, what what does that mean in terms of uh, extending beyond your four walls? Uh, even beyond alignment with the lab or the university or working with startups, working with um, other community partners. How, how, yeah. What's your view towards that? Well, you know, uh, so TVA, uh, TVA was built as an innovation company. We were a demonstration agency. So TVA nine decades ago was built to harness the river, reforest the hills. We had to develop the fertilizer industry to drive, uh, to drive, uh, agriculture. You know, we developed the first high voltage insulators, built the first 500,000 volt transmission lines, early adopters in nuclear. So at its origin, TVA was an innovation company. But I've told our team that somewhere over over the intervening years, we sort of lost that view of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And and we need we need to get back there where we're innovating inside the company and where this mammoth operation that we have uh, pr uh, allows itself to be used as a way to test new technologies, new ideas, and can can gain support from TVA to scale those up across our system. Because the next 20 years in energy is going to be all about innovation. And I would just share with you, you know, just in TVA, aside from uh, developing that innovation culture, so that we're innovating every day, we're focused right now on, on what we call six signature technologies that I think are going to shape mm -hmm. the energy industry over the next decade. And I'll just tell you what they are quickly. Uh, grid transformation, the transformation of this mammoth electrical transmission distribution system into one that doesn't just flow one way, but is an integrated system with the kind of ability to use big data, AI, visualization, control to really export it, grid mm -hmm. transformation storage integration, uh, the ability to store energy uh, and, and shape energy demand and, and supply is going to be tremendous. The third is, uh, is connected communities. So, so, so the, the ability to connect these communities and to take advantage of that in terms of insight and knowledge and also to be able to shape energy usage in a real active way is going to be critical. Um, I think electric vehicle deployment mm -hmm. uh, over the next uh, 10 years is going to be tremendous. And that comes with a whole range of technologies. And then the last two here are, are advanced nuclear designs. We, we've in order to in order to to uh, decarbonize this, uh, this energy system and this economy, it's going to be difficult to do it without a next generation of nuclear. And then the last is decarbonization options. How do mm -hmm. we how do we drive this economy from a high carbon inco economy to a low carbon economy? So and it's a long answer, Jonathan, but I, I think that TBA has got to be innovative in our operations internally. We've mm -hmm. got to be a prime mover between behind these six signature technologies and and engage entrepreneurs and thinkers and scientists across the economy to develop things that then we can take and support deployment as a test bed and then as a large scale if they prove effective. So to, to build on that, I think when um, all of those stakeholders involved with TVA, you know, I grew up here in East Tennessee and for a long time, TVA was a total mystery in terms of like what TVA even even does. And, and so um, something that I was thinking about, was the bedrock of innovation and startup companies 
uh, through my time at the Knoxville Entrepreneur Center was listening to the customer, let the customer guide um, the innovation, the product. Now that uh, I'm in more corporate consulting, same thing, right? Like big companies have to listen to their customers and let the, them facilitate the buyer experience. How does TVA uh, kind of let the customer lead? How do you listen to your, I know you have a lot of different customers from businesses and consumers and partners like the lab, but what's your view towards how you can let, you know, basically use customer discovery to drive mm -hmm. your, your the best experience possible. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, here's the way I think about this, Jonathan, we, in terms of our direct customers, we serve very large industrial and commercial customers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I meet with them literally weekly. As a matter of fact, I just got off the phone with the organization that represents our 58 biggest industrial customers. And we were talking about what their shareholders are demanding what their customers for their products are demanding mm -hmm. in, in terms of uh, in terms of sustainability, in terms of carbon reduction, what their business needs in terms of reliability and power quality, uh, how we can team together. So uh, I listen to our industrial customers. We sell power to 153 local power companies who in turn have customers. Mm -hmm. So Knoxville Utility Board is a is as one of my uh is one of the local power companies i engage with so i stay very tightly tied with gabe bolus and kub mm -hmm. so that i can hear from them the voices coming from the people of knoxville and the surrounding areas that that they serve and uh that generates ideas um and as a matter of fact we have recently moved to um not just uh, using that to focus tva's innovation but to help utilities like KUB set up uh, innovation at their own scale and flexibility to be able to respond more directly to their customer needs without having to have TVA get in the middle of that. Wow. So that's that. I mean, that's the, that's the true essence of an ecosystem, right? I mean, if you're kind of mm -hmm. brokering and supporting others, to, it's almost like open source. Um, mm -hmm. that's exactly. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. Uh, that's that's really exciting to hear about. Um, do you see TVA moving towards, you, you talked about when you're talking about the six, connecting communities with number three um, mm -hmm. in terms of the kind of pillar of innovation you see in the next 20 years. When you say connected communities, do you mean connecting them like from the energy grid or do you mean moving towards more things like connecting via internet or is it more of a kind of connecting mind share? What do you mean by connecting? Yeah, bo both of these, Jonathan. So um, it, at at one level, TBA was created to electrify this part of the economy and uh, provide ubiquitous access to, to, to uh, the internet and all that it means to these communities, uh, we see as also a part of our mission, if not directly, then indirectly, right? Mm -hmm. Particularly in this part of the country, we still serve one of the poorest areas of the, of the nation. And, and uh, if you live around here, you know that you don't have to go very far from a city before you don't have high-speed internet access. Right. And so uh, TBA is interested in supporting communities and local power companies and others at gaining access and connecting these communities. As a matter of fact, right now I, I'm build, building uh, thousands of miles of fiber backbone uh, to, to um, smarten up our whole system and allowing others to ride on that to deliver uh, internet service where they need to. And so um, that's part of what we mean by connected communities. But beyond that, uh, you know, TVA generates, uh, we generate more electricity uh, mm -hmm. than almost every other utility in the country. We're number three in, in electricity generated. We're the second largest transmission system. So if we can connect with communities where we can pull data and insight about their energy use, and if we can help to actively shape that working with them, mm -hmm. we can gain huge advantage that, that will result in lower energy prices smaller environmental footprint, more reliability across the, the seven states that we serve. So we're interested in broadband deployment. 
uh, as part of our economic development mission. But I'm also interested in getting communities smart and connected because it will help us run a better energy system here in this part of the country. So I just got the uh, two minute warning, my timekeeper here. Um, and I feel like we're just getting started. Um, if I wanted to learn more about the, um, of the internet, the fiber backbone that TVA is building just for my own nerd purposes of wanting to read it late at night, uh, where could I find mm -hmm. more information on that? Yeah, you can you can get to our website, and uh, and I'm sure if you follow the the trail through there, you'll get to what we're doing there. I'd also be happy uh, to connect you with Joe Hoagland. Joe Hoagland is the executive who's got sponsorship for our innovation initiative, and up under that is our broadband deployment. Excellent, I would love that. So my last question is, uh, what are you most excited about in the next twelve months? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I think you're going to see in the, just the next 12 months, but leading into the next five years, a, a, a real continued turning by industry and the economy toward developing a set of technologies that are going to transform the energy system over the next 10 or 20 years. It certainly includes technologies that people like to hear about, renewables, solar, et cetera, um, which are a critical part of it. Uh, but there'll be there'll be a much broader portfolio of technologies that it takes to do this. Uh, everything from new nuclear uh, to how we deploy uh, artificial intelligence, pattern recognition, um, augmented reality in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think over the this thing's going to continue to gain momentum uh, and not just over the next 12 months, but over the next five years, you're going to see tremendous opportunity here. Um, well, I am makes me pleased to know that some that you are thinking so big and so broad about uh, such an the mission and, and have bringing that vision to TVA because it has such an impact and not just even on Tennessee, but the you know, the seven states that you serve. So uh, I'm excited to see that. And I really appreciate you being here with us today. It was very, very nice to meet you, Jeff. Very good to meet you, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. Oh, yes. I swear I'd love to give every, give Jeff Flyash a round of applause, but uh, <laughs> look for the uh, the emojis on the in the chat. That's your, okay. that's your applause. Okay. Who's the director of Oak Ridge National Lab? Actually, it's Alex. <laughs> um, Sorry about that. Your audio cut out for a second, but you were good. So just me. Am I good now? Okay, excellent. That's pretty cool how he just comes in like a guardian angel, uh, like and and fixes uh, whatever whatever the problem is. So thank you for that, Alex. And um, you're, I'll be your wingman anytime. So, uh, Dr. Thomas Zachariah from Oak Ridge National Lab will be here, I'm sure, Zoom popping in here any second. Uh, in the meantime, I was going to share with you about an upcoming Launch Tennessee event that they wanted to share about. Oh, I'll talk about that later. Dr. Zachariah, my Hi, name is John Sexton. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you as well. Um, thank you for joining us today at uh, 3686 Now. Um, we've been having conversations today talking about how Tennessee's greatest institutions provide such a competitive advantage in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship um, statewide. And then my heart's in East Tennessee. And um, we only have a few minutes, so I want to try and get to five questions today. Uh, if you get to five, you will have achieved beating Randy Boyd and Jeff Lyash uh, in succinctness. Um, I think Randy got three and Jeff got four. So uh, okay. my, my first question for you is um, you've, you've been at the lab uh, since 1987. You took over as director in 2017. If I don't believe someone that you would be at the lab uh, 
build a career out of the lab if you were not moved and inspired by the mission of the lab. So what is it that, that really drives you and inspires you about Oak Ridge National Lab and the work that you do? Oak Ridge National Laboratory is a special place. It's unfortunate that not too many people know about it, but you know, you get to work at a place that truly, you know, it was created to win a war and we did. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so this is an institution that is designed and built to win a war and change the world. And we do it every time, every day. Mm -hmm. So right now, in the most recent few months, we've been, we've been part of the fight against the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I can confidently say that there is not a single person on this planet Earth, at least living in, in sort of a, a modern world, that, that has not been touched by a technology that is developed at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, it's exciting to know that, that we are changing the world from right here in East Tennessee. Um, and, and I appreciate the, your work to keep pushing that forward. Um, I was doing my homework, and, and I've heard you speak uh, I heard you speak last when Brad Feld came to town, um, and and that was a really great day out at the laboratory. Uh, but you talk a lot about innovation cities and how they need to exist beyond the coast. And it feels like there's a really good opportunity here for that. Um, but one thing you've said, I've read that you said, was that for an innovation center is it's got to be focused on talent, R&D investments, and a supportive ecosystem. How would you characterize or define what sort of ecosystem looks like? So that obviously there are a number of ways you can think of the supportive ecosystem, but the way I have been thinking about particularly of late is try to think about place-based um, ecosystem, um, innovation ecosystem. Um, there are a number of examples globally where people have tried to do that. What is remarkable about uh, uh, Tennessee as a whole is that if you if you if you go beyond the coastal towns or coastal cities, um, there is a, actually a, a number of studies that has been done to look at what are the next 100 uh, cities with innovation potential. Mm -hmm. A state of Tennessee has four out of those 100 cities. Uh, Knoxville is ranked number 44 followed by Nashville, Memphis, and Chattanooga. Those are the four major cities. Now, the difference between Knoxville and the number one city, which happens to be Syracuse, mm -hmm. is not that much. And frankly, I think that uh, sort of aligning what you just heard between what Randy and the University of Tennessee has to offer, Jeff and TVA has to offer, mm -hmm. and certainly Oak Ridge National Laboratory has to offer, together with the community support and aligning you know, the local, state, and federal government resources in order to drive uh, a creative environment is something that is really an exciting opportunity. The, the word alignment has come up in all three of the conversations today. Um, what, to, what does alignment mean to you, and, and what do you feel like are the drivers of it, or, or, the, or what stands in the way, the barriers to true community alignment? Well, I mean, I think um, both Randy and Jeff touched on it, you know, to, to some extent, the Knoxville entrepreneurial ecosystem is is somewhat, uh, uh, in, you know, invisible to the uh, uh, to the national and international community. And to the extent that we want to attract talent and resources to come into this area to make it a vibrant environment, I think we, we have to, you know, that TVA, Oak Ridge, and, and, and UT offers a great megaphone. Mm -hmm. you, uh, UT offers a huge talent pool. You guys touched on it. And, and uh, Oak Ridge offers a tremendous sort of time machine for future technologies, right? I mean, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Jensen Huang, who's the CEO of NVIDIA, uh, you know, he, deci he designed the, the GPU uh, uh, um, sitting with us at a dinner table at uh, Bistro by the Tracks. Now, not too many people know that Jensen was here 10 years ago in 2009, and we were sitting around designing what he needed to do to make the make uh, NVIDIA now the AI powerhouse platform they are, mm -hmm. right? So when Jensen came in 2009, they were a $20 billion gaming processor company. 
Today, they are close to 260, 280 million, billion dollars in market cap. Likewise, we work very closely with Lisa Su and AMD. And so the point is that uh, Oak Ridge offers, offers up an opportunity as to what might be possible. And my, my, my coolest thing to say is that in 1995, I was working on the fastest supercomputer in the world at the time, which was an Intel Paragon. If you have an iPhone 6 or better, you have a, a, a computing platform that is faster than the fastest supercomputer 20, 25 years ago. And there are 2 billion such units today globally. Yeah. So, so the idea is to connect those kinds of technology opportunities, the innovation opportunities with entrepreneurs, with UT, with TVA, to create that kind of a, uh, an environment where people want to come and be part of it, much like Bradfeld. So you said at the beginning that there is not a person in the world, um, probably literally, that has not been touched by technology developed at the lab. Um, yet it, it, uh, the innovation ecosystem here remains somewhat invisible um, in your words. And so what's the gap between those two things? You know, um, what's, what's missing from the ecosystem to be able to, um, I, and I appreciate that, that telling our story is a big part of that, but are there other things missing from a, like in the talent gap uh, in between turning these world changing technologies into unicorns, um, billion dollar companies? Yeah, so yeah, you know, uh, uh, Jonathan, I think is a great question. So much of the, the, the life of uh, the, the laboratory, 76 years old mm -hmm. this year, right? We, we were sort of behind the fence, secret city. In fact, uh, Skidmore Owings Merrill, who designed uh, the city of Oak Ridge, designed it without a city center because they did not want people congregating together and, and talking to each other and find out what the laboratory was doing. We are trying to open the laboratory up to actually be an engaged partner with the community. One of the things that Randy uh, and the University of Tennessee is doing in partnership with the laboratory is to establish this Oak Ridge Institute, which is going to be a University of Tennessee enterprise in the, on the campus of Oak Ridge National Laboratory that trains the next generation of students and entrepreneurs. We have this innovation crossroads, which is funding, uh, you know, selecting and funding entrepreneurs, and some of them are graduating. And, and hopefully, we will in, be much more intentional about supporting an entrepreneurial ecosystem, working with people like you and the community that we are engaged with, both here, but also across uh, the state of Tennessee. So if the uh, Innovation Crossroads, I am a big fan of this program uh, and a lot of the work that you guys do. And, and one thing I've working with startups that have come out of the laboratory, tech, tech transfer as a, as a category can be a challenge um, from a, because a lot of times I've thought it was, um, and I may be wrong, it, 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 sometimes it's a solution looking for a problem, right? You've got this amazing technology, but there's so many opportunities for it. How do you even pick one? Um, is that, do you share that view or uh, do you have an alternate perspective on tech transfer and what can we do as an ecosystem to better support technology transfer? I, I think, uh, um, I think you're spot on. I, I think that uh, when we are working with technology, right, I mean, um, we have a different objective. We have a mission objective. Uh, now, the, as we engage with the entrepreneurial community, they will look at it and say, they are the ones who bring the problems and say, oh, I see this, as opposed to the hammer looking for the nail. Right. You, you, you by engaging with the community, engaging with companies like TVA, you know, Jeff outlined half a dozen major challenges. And so between the challenges, together with some of the unique world leading um, hammers or tools that we have, right. and with entrepreneurs in between, you can connect these major technology solutions to practical applications. I have, um, I just thought of another question. I was thinking last night I wanted to ask you and I didn't write it down. It just came back to me. So I'm going to, I'm going to trust the instinct and go with it, which is that uh, the lab is a huge attractor, like talent magnet. So like some of the top minds in the U S from around the world, 
come to the lab sometime for an internship for a program for three months, six months, and then they leave. Oh, well, I mean, many stay, but many, many go. And that's not necessarily the lab's responsibility. And that's the nature of students in that age who come to do those things. But what's your view on how the community that surrounds the lab um, could do to be more sticky, perhaps, to, to talent that's coming, even if it's just coming to visit um, for a little while? Um, uh, again, I think well, I think it is a is a great question. Part of it is that uh, you know um, your generation, the current generation, they like to be in a in a place where they can live, work, and play. Mm -hmm. That's not how we are designed. We we've designed to where you know if you think about Oak Ridge National Laboratory, people drive into work in the morning, mm -hmm. and then they drive out to in the evening to go to their homes. Whereas, you know, so creating that kind of a down, downtown Knoxville vibe. Um, and so what can we do? Well, one thing that we can do, again, working with Randy, is uh, to see how what can Oak Ridge do to have some sort of a presence, some, some portal to engage sort of the downtown vibrancy. But you, can, you would also agree that downtown Knoxville is too small for our aspirations it's so so we also want to grow that that kind of an entrepreneur i mean a collaborative uh environment much more broadly yeah. uh you you know randy was mentioning that you and thomas used to be in a band together oh uh, we were not in the same band but we definitely performed together uh shows and things like that yeah. okay so, I, so this must have been this must have been later. So my son, who grew up here, was born here, grew up here. He and Thomas were friends and was part of the earlier evolution of band, uh, mm -hmm. right? And and I have tried to. So you asked about other people. Here is somebody who was born in East Tennessee, grew up in East Tennessee, went to Farragut High School. Um, mm -hmm. He's one of those fortunate people who was who, who started a company. It was a, a unicorn and uh, in New York City. I've tried a number of times to get him to to consider Knoxville as they are expanding to other cities and mm -hmm. and and even for somebody who has grown grown up here we have not communicated the value proposition right so uh, as they are looking for places to expand to uh, I would say hey why don't you come and and his general concern is is there enough software engineers and is there enough talent and so to some extent, I don't want to minimize the importance of telling our story as a place where you have enough people that they can find uh, to work with. Did, did he mention anything about sales? Because um, one, one, this is my own observation, but many times when you have deep, deep technology, what sometimes what we lack, I feel like, in the statewide ecosystem might be the experience of, of executives and things that know how to grow a company. Um, beyond just being the inventor, is that something that you've you've seen? Um, I, I think I think that is true. I think in 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 his case, uh, you know, he straight out of school, he he joined a startup. He was the you know thirty sixth employee, which went on to become a multi billion dollar startup. Mm -hmm. But but here, as entrepreneurs are inherently risk takers, so he gave up three quarters of his stocks. Um, to to uh, because he and his colleague won a uh, New York accelerator, and so he gave up three quarters of guaranteed stocks to to for fifteen thousand dollars and three months of office space in New York City, right? And 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 the and their business plan lasted twenty four hours. After that, they had to reinvent themselves. Uh, so why New York City? Well, in this particular case, they are much more closer to the market that they are serving. But it's at the core, mm -hmm. uh, they're a technology company and uh, they want to go where the talent is. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and what I would say is that places like Knoxville has a tremendous advantage because many of the companies today, uh, Silicon Valley uh, is not a good place to be because even if you, if, even if both of you are working, you know, husband and wife are working they are still commuting an hour, hour and a half. It's very expensive. Mm. The quality of life that we have in Knoxville is is tremendous. And so, 
I'm still hopeful that he will eventually move here. Good. Uh, just wait, does he have kids yet? Because uh, that might be the uh, the. the you know, he's working on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm a little we're a little over, but I asked everybody else. So I'm going to ask you: What are you most excited about in the next twelve months? Well, the next twelve months, uh, you know, uh, two things I'm going to say. One, we're going to deploy yet again the fastest computer in the world, the first exascale computer which is going to be an AMD MI200 GPU-based uh, supercomputer. And that's going to be, uh, you know, so again, the focus of the world's attention is going to be here. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be also the fastest AI artificial intelligence platform. But the one that I'm really most excited about is working with Randy and Jeff about aligning our three institutions to really work on this place-based innovation to create an innovation ecosystem that that makes knoxville and east tennessee the go-to place for to be the next uh, uh, entrepreneurial city uh, I, if you will just permit me to i just want to give you statistics almost the majority of the innovation jobs that have been created in the last 15 years have been in 41 counties in the united states mm -hmm. there are over 3,000 counties in this country. And there is increasing desire to drive innovation to, to mid-America, Appalachian region, et cetera. And there are a couple of uh, bills that are being championed by in the Senate that is talking about investing $80 billion towards creating such innovation ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited about trying to keep our city and our region and our state uh, you know, top of mind as people are thinking about these investment opportunities. Um, well, I can't think of a higher note to close on. All I have to say is about that is uh, let's do it. <laughs> well, we'll work with you to do that because ultimately you guys are the ones who are going to make it happen. Our job is to is to help you achieve that create that creative environment. And Dr. Zachariah, it was a pleasure to speak with you today, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, to spend some time together so uh i would love to i would i would invite the crowd to give you an applause right now but uh they're a very quiet crowd so uh so i'll have everyone and put your applause in the chat and i uh, hope to see you again soon thank you so much i appreciate it thank you for having me thanks all right that was pretty rapid fire um right there so let's see here Oh, yeah. Before Dr. Zachariah, I was going to tell you about a, an, an event, but I lost my notes. Uh, that's coming up for Launch Tennessee, a separate event. Um, let's see here. Sorry about that. Oh, November 17th at 1130 a.m. Central. Um, Launch Tennessee's quarterly Southeast Capital Call aimed at bringing people together around capital and investment landscape in Tennessee. Um, it's going to focus on ag tech uh, and the keynote's going to be Rob Don Donsky, the food and agribusiness leader at EY. Um, so if you're serious about deal flow and the company pipeline in Tennessee in the Southeast, you should totally come and there will be a link sent to you after um, this event via email. So if you're interested, uh, you can sign up there. And so next, I believe I will be bringing up my friend Mani. To the stage. Money. I'm sure they're phoning him in and he's doing that 30 second uh, wait time for when you're coming up onto the stage. It's really interesting to think about uh, the uh, the UT, TVA, and the lab kind of joining together. Um, and partnering in new ways. Hey, Jonathan, how are you? Hey, welcome. How are you? <laughs> how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. And thank you so much for moderating. Great job so far. Oh, it's my pleasure. You're taking over here, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It's uh, it's been a pleasure, and I, I really appreciate you inviting me to do so. And it's been exciting to have you uh, around. So welcome home. Thank you. Thank you. So
So thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all the participants who joined this afternoon for our program. I'd like to extend a warm Tennessee welcome and my deepest gratitude to our three global tech leaders. and pillars of the East Tennessee community, President Randy Boyd, Jeff Lyash, and Thomas Zachariah. I'd also like to acknowledge our sponsors, Launch Tennessee and Van Tucker, one of our visionary women leaders in Tennessee, and Jim Big, CEO of the Knoxville Entrepreneurship Center, who has given all of himself to support entrepreneurship in Knoxville. I'd also like to thank Dr. Hashem Hashimian, a board member of Launch Tennessee and a tireless supporter of young entrepreneurs in East Tennessee. And finally, I'd like to extend my heartfelt thanks to our incredible MC, the one and only Jonathan Sexton, and to our three interviewers, Bill Mox and McKeever Conwell. And with that, it's my honor to introduce our three guest speakers for the evening, who for many of you need no introduction at all. Uh, Steve Blank is considered by many to be the father of modern entrepreneurship. Steve launched the Lean Startup Movement and is the author of The Four Steps to the Epiphany, The Startup Owner's Manual, which are irreplaceable books for any entrepreneur, and teaches at Stanford, Columbia, Berkeley, and NYU. Steve created the National Science Foundation's Innovation Core, now the standard for science commercialization in the U.S. Steve's work at Stanford is changing the way the U.S. Defense and State Departments are deploying innovation with speed and urgency. And in 2013, Forbes listed Steve as one of the 30 most influential people in tech. Next, we have Laura Ariaga Andreessen, who has for decades been empowering women and entrepreneurs to pursue leadership roles and encouraging people to make an impact in their communities, workplaces, and society. Laura is the founder and chairman of the Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society, the Laura Ariaga Andreessen and the Silicon Valley Social Venture Fund. At the Stanford Graduate School of Business, Laura has developed and taught courses on so strategic philanthropy, women in leadership, and inclusive leadership. Laura's New York Times bestseller, Giving 2.0, which I encourage all of you to read, encourages people of all backgrounds to give with greater intent and impact. Laura, among many other honors, has been awarded the Jacqueline Kennedy Award for Women in Leadership, as well as the Henry Crown Fellow Post at the Aspen Institute, and with her husband, venture capitalist Mark Andreessen, received the Global Citizen Awards from the World Affairs Council. And last but not least, we're honored to have Russ Siegelman, who spent over 20 years in business and technology, spanning many roles as a manager, investor, and director. Russ spent 11 years as a partner at Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield, and Byers, where he invested in consumer and technology related markets. Prior to KPCB, Russ Siegelman worked directly for Bill Gates at Microsoft, where he launched the Microsoft Network, or MSN, and the Slate Projects. Russ is the chairman of the board of the Global Innovation Fund, a $200 million impact investment fund that backs social entrepreneurs around the world. As a lecturer at the Stanford Business School, he teaches amazing courses that I've been fortunate enough to sit in, like Startup Garage, Product Launch, and Starting and Growing a Social Venture. Russ, Laura, Steve, on behalf of the entire Tennessee and Southeast community here tonight, my greatest thanks for taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedules to share your unique knowledge, passion, and insights with us. And with that, I'll turn it to Laura Ariaga Andreessen and our first panel. Thank you so much, Thank you. What an honor to be here, especially in such esteemed company. Thank you so much for um, your time today, Laura. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. 
Um, one thing I want to bring up to everybody before we get into our conversation with Laura, if you're looking at your chat box, you'll notice that there's three tabs at the top. The furthest to the right one says Q&A. While Laura and I are having our conversation, if there's any questions that pop into your head while she's speaking, please feel free to put them in that area um, because following our fireside chat, we'll do a little Q&A and I'll be going to that tab to pull the questions from everybody so we can get them answered for you. Um, so Laura, I, one thing I think we both uh, found out that we're very kindred spirits and we're very much passionate about the same things, women and, and underrepresented groups in leadership positions. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> so to um, start off our conversation, I would love for you to tell everyone a little bit about how your work at the Stanford's Graduate School of Business and with your foundation, LAAF, um, are helping to address some of the unique challenges that women and members of the underrepresented groups face in the workplace. I would love to, Catherine. It is a privilege for me to be in conversation with you. I am a huge fan of Let Her Speak, and it's an honor to be a panelist with such esteemed company as Steve Blank, who is an amazing philanthropist, and Russ Siegelman, who is one of my peers at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Um, so yes, your question about how my work as an educator at Stanford GSB informs my work at my operating foundation, LAF, as we love to call it, .org. Um, so my work on women in leadership was originally inspired by the birth of my beloveds and my son. When we found out that we were having a boy, I realized that he would obviously, because of his parents, be a white male who was born into privilege and he would have access to opportunities that so many of his peers would not. That realization inspired my new life purpose of empowering a new generation, in particular a new generation of women and creating an inclusive leadership model, which I call accessible leadership which I'll talk about um, in a few minutes. But like everyone in the audience today, I'm sure can absolutely empathize um, when you have a life-changing event, such as the birth of a child, I was inspired to manifest my values in new ways. And that inspiration led to me researching and creating and teaching what is now Stanford Business School's first course on women and leadership, a course dedicated solely to empowering women as well as individuals from other underrepresented groups and our allies to meet the current challenges that exist in today's workplaces, regardless of what stage we are at in our careers. And that course really opened up the possibility of reaching countless more individuals outside of Stanford through laugh.org, which is an educational content provider. Um, we develop giving guides on the philanthropy front, but we also develop tactical toolkits which draw, which draw on over 200 research-based driven tactics, tools, and strategies that not only help women um, underrepresented groups and, uh, and our allies meet these challenges, but also empower all of us to change the processes, the policies, and the cultures for 
um, creating the workplaces that we all want to see and be a part of workplaces that are more diverse, more impactful, and more inclusive. And some of the topics that we cover in these tactical toolkits include mentorship and sponsorship, negotiation, leadership styles, mastering the art of giving and receiving feedback. And I'm happy to report that many of these toolkits are free. Well, all of them are free. Um, and they are, uh, many are already available to download on our website. And if you sign up for our newsletter, you will also receive notifications of the dozens more that we will be launching in the coming 24 months. Which I am, I can at least say I am really, really looking forward. I feel like everything that you are producing through Laugh is everything that I was looking for when I was a young woman first, you know, figuring out my own leader role and my own journey. Um, I you know, one thing. Oh, I'm, oh. I'm No, no, go ahead, Laura. <laughs> to say, Catherine, to your point, essentially all of this content is for me as well, exactly the content that I wish I had had coming out of undergrad and business school to empower me for my career in male dominated industries. And interestingly, and this was surprising for me, but thrilling, the this content is just as applicable to me right now 25 years into my leadership journey as it would have been for me 25 years ago so it stands to the test of time that is absolutely true i was going to mention some of the the topics that you highlighted that you cover in the the leadership toolkit are exactly the same topics that I heard when I was interviewing women as I was starting Let Her Speak. And so I feel like it's it's always continuously evergreen. It's, it's very similar regardless of where you're at. Absolutely, and divine orchestration that this amazing convening brought you and I together and our teams together so that we can partner on this work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Better together. Always. <laughs> yeah. Um, so going a little bit into, you know, the the modern day, what's going on right now for women and upper and underrepresented groups in the US. Uh, it's you don't have to look too far in Google to find tons of articles about the extra amount of hardships that have been placed on women and underrepresented communities because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so one thing that I would love for you to discuss is where do you see the greatest opportunities for allies, mentors, and sponsors to really step in and make an impact to help out these groups? I love this question, perfectly timed. So like anyone who is in a position to be an ally, be a mentor, be a sponsor, likely, um, even if you don't hold any of those um, formal or informal positions, as a decision maker, as a policy creator, or as a process or organizational culture influencer, you have the ability to create positive change in this arena. So with each of these roles comes an extraordinary responsibility to ensure that organizations aren't merely surviving through these extremely challenging external circumstances, but rather that they are thriving during these challenges. So having an organization thrive necessitates creating policies and cultures that allow employees to show up as the best versions of themselves, both in the workplace 
and outside of the workplace. So what does that look like in practice? Here are five things. I will try to keep them as brief as possible um, that employers or people in a position to influence can do. The first would be flexible work hours and schedules to accommodate caregivers. Flexibility um, that, that while is becoming more common is still far from the norm. There are great examples of this type of flexibility, which include job sharing, compressed hours, flexible time, part-time options. Importantly, practices have shown that these flexible accommodations lead to importantly higher retention rates for women and for any caregiver who's also a member of the workplace. Number two, it's not just flexibility about schedules, it is also flexibility around where we work. And one of the unexpected blessings amidst the tsunami of challenges that COVID is giving us is that the norm around where employees work is being challenged. This working strictly as an in-office phenomenon um, is, has been totally debunked because the majority of us have been forced to work remotely, particularly in the knowledge economy. And so that, that gives us proof points around productivity, around the ability to communicate, collaborate, co-create, um, convene in equally as powerful ways virtually as we have done traditionally physically. Um, so I'm thrilled about that development. And number three, I, as I describe in detail in my inclusivity in the workplace tactical toolkit, which you can download um, from laugh.org, there are both workplace policies and individual actions that we can all create and take that support women and other individuals from underrepresented groups. From a policy perspective, organizations need to think critically about their personnel management. And this starts with hiring practices, how job candidates are sourced, assessed, recruited, interviewed. And it goes all the way through the performance evaluation process, making sure that both formal and informal norms will address both conscious and unconscious bias throughout these processes. Um, that is going to be absolutely critical for us to not merely welcome, but rather to support and help make successful a complex and beautiful diversity of identities in any workplace. And then finally, number five, on an individual level, there is so much that we can do inside our organizations from helping with skill building, being a mentor, um, providing access to opportunities. Some spe specific and very easy micro tactics that anyone can deploy would be when you're holding a meeting, set the norms up front for a no interruption policy. Make sure that if you're facilitating the meeting that you specifically call out everyone in the meeting and give everyone the chance to participate and let their ideas be elevated and heard. And these type of individual um, actions can have a dramatic impact 
on the empowerment of every employee in a professional setting? I think every single one of those, I, in my mind, I was saying, yes, 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 absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. I didn't have my pom poms, but I, I completely That's agree. I, it, um, I think you, basically to, to summarize a little bit of the points you were making is that a lot of these, these needs for change to create these um, more supportive workplaces, it really comes from changing from the inside out as an existing leader, changing how you are perceiving and the own biases that you become more aware of and changing how you're setting the norms and the tones for the meetings you're leading, which therefore then can lead to changing the organization from the inside out that can lead to the community changing from the inside out. Yes, I love that um, clarification, Catherine, because it is a ripple effect. Yesterday, I was having a conversation with my friend, Sheila McDaniel, who is the chief administrator at the National Gallery of Art. And she was talking about the importance of, as she calls it, being a leader of one. So even if you don't have direct reports, even if you aren't running a team, a division, or an organization, you are still leading by your own example. So every time you act, you react or you interact both in the professional arena as well as in your personal or your social or your religious community or your volunteer communities arenas, you have the ability to lead by example and never underestimate the power of your influence as an individual. People watch how other people, whether they are your supervisors, your peers, your direct reports, people once, twice, thrice removed from you, people take notice of how we treat one another as human beings and how we value one another as human beings. And now more than ever before, how we value one another as human beings needs to make manifest the highest level of dignity for everyone. Absolutely. It was beautifully said. Uh, I cannot agree, agree more. <laughs> um, uh, so and going into, we talked a little bit about the, the hardships that, that women are facing and, and underrepresented groups are facing due to the pandemic, but there's been barriers that have been very, very long standing that are systemic, that are built into the cultures of organizations and into communities. Um, what do you think are some of the greatest ones that exist specifically in the entrepreneurial and tech ecosystems? Um, and what steps do you think leaders and influencers can take to alleviate a lot of those barriers? I love and appreciate your framing around these barriers, particularly as they relate to Silicon Valley. But I, I would ask for your generosity in the breadth of my response, because one of the things that I have found as an educator of 20 years is that the challenges that individuals in the tech space face are the exact same challenges that women and individuals from other underrepresented groups face in the fields of finance, in accounting, consulting, um, in the healthcare community, in academia, in the social change sector, you name in the military, you name it. Um, these these challenges permeate every industry, and so I think it's critically important that we go into this answer fully cognizant of the universality of 
barriers that women and underrepresented groups face. Three that come to mind immediately would be lack of mentorship and sponsorship, not recognizing the value and per, the value that we have as individuals and being very proactive and intentional about influencing the narrative that we have about ourselves as women, but also that other people have about us. And then challenges and barriers around negotiations, something that a, a skill that we all have to deploy throughout our career. So some steps to alleviate these barriers regarding mentorship and sponsorship. Um, senior leaders can create, actually, I wouldn't even say senior leaders, anybody beyond the very most junior entry level can create both formal and informal opportunities to speak with women and individuals from underrepresented groups about their work. What's interesting is that research has shown that women are often over mentored and under sponsored. So what does that mean? Men or what is the difference between the two? Mentorship largely centers around personal growth. So you as an individual, how you are going to evolve. Whereas sponsorship entails specific acts by individuals that will help you advance in your career. So acts of sponsorships can include actively advocating for someone's advancement and development inside of an organization. So giving them leads on opportunities for projects or for other growth assignments shining a light on work that they've done to their supervisor. Um, ex uh, an easy example that anyone at any level can practice would be after somebody delivers a great presentation or a sales pitch or shares an idea in a meeting, take five minutes of your time and capture that success and send it to their supervisor. It doesn't matter if it comes from somebody who is below you, beside you, or above you in the organizational hierarchy. Every, every um, act of support can be deeply meaningful. So uh, to the, the second topic around your narrative and owning your own value. As women, we can use myriad different tactics to shape our personal narrative and to pitch our unique value. One of the things that I have my students do that I find immensely helpful in my own career is what I call the three adjectives exercise. So I have my students write down what are the three ideal adjectives that they want people to use about them in a particular work context or volunteer context or um, community-based context, and then come up with succinct examples of how you are manifesting those traits or characteristics. When you introduce yourself to somebody within a professional setting, work those adjectives into your conversation. Um, and that is a way that you can influence not only how people think about you, but also how people talk about you. If you do not own your own value as an individual contributor, you do not give other people the capacity to own your value and recognize it and celebrate it as well. And then on the negotiation front, I would say 
do as much research as possible on market comps for compensation packages. Whenever you are interviewing for a position, see it through. See the entire negotiation process through. Number one, you'll get invaluable experience learning the ins and outs of negotiation. Um, but number two, you will also have a much broader understanding and you'll have a learning opportunity to dive deep and expand your industry knowledge. Also, it's never endingly astonishing to me how men are constantly talking about money and sharing, oh, I make this or I got this offer or I got this much for my bonus this year. How much did you get? And as women, we are always encouraged to never talk about money because it is crass. If women shared with their trusted networks what their salaries were and that and those networks included their male counterparts, I guarantee you we would be asking for a lot more money, just like men have no problem asking for a lot more money. And interestingly, when women start out, even a few thousand dollars less than men do in their first jobs out of college, over the course of the career, that can result in 100 uh, or hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of a delta between what men ultimately make and what women ultimately make. We have to explode that disparity. I completely agree. And I, I think to your your last point is is redefining the norms around discussing money and and redefining mm -hmm. it. You first have to become comfortable with yourself talking about it and then create the culture in your inner circles of being OK with talking about it with others. Um, and I love the adjective. We actually um, at Let Her Speak developed a manifesto writing workbook. And that is step two is define your adjectives as you're writing your own manifesto. So I feel like you and I could probably talk for you know hours about this exact same topic. Um, so thank you so much because I want to be mindful of the time. Um, but before we go to Q&A, Laura, was there anything else you wanted to share or mention before we start um, having the questions asked? Yes, I would love to just briefly speak about the leadership model that I have been developing over the last three years and will be launching formally in 2021, which is what I call accessible leadership. Accessible leadership is my leadership archetype that defines leadership as not solely for the advancement of oneself or one's organization, but intentionally for the advancement of others, specifically individuals who traditionally have lacked equal access to paths to formal leadership positions. Importantly, you do not need to be in a formal leadership position to be an accessible leader. Accessible leadership is about accessing the leader that is already within every one of us. It's about recognizing and utilizing the influence that you already have in your personal and professional networks at every stage of your life and career, leading by example. It's how you act, how you make choices, and how you interact. It requires empathy. It requires intentionality about impact, the impact that you want to have. And most of all, it prizes inclusivity because we 
we are as a nation we are as a world a spectacularly and beautifully diverse human race and it is in that spectacular diversity that lies our greatest power i absolutely agree all the power all the innovation everything is because we're all different um and uh actually we are a little over time so um thank you so much laura the questions that are on the q a tab will stay on there so if you want to answer those like in the chatter or anything you you can do that but i want to thank you so much for your time for your wisdom your insights um, I really, really appreciate it. I think we all appreciate it. So everybody give Laura a round of applause. Thank you so Everyone much. Everyone give Catherine a round of applause. <laughs> and what an honor and joy, Catherine, to have our paths intertwined because of this opportunity. And everyone, please, Visit us at laugh.org, L-A-A-F.org, and download all of our free resources. Yep, they are incredible. 100% uh, agreed. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you, Catherine. Bless you all. Hello, everyone. It's your friendly virtual experience host. We are working through a couple of uh, issues uh, in the green room, but uh, sit tight. We'll be right with you in our next exciting speaking session.